What I would like to do before we get started with the code is to look at the syllabus. So if I go into uh, stat 523 and look at the class schedule, I made a few changes. Of course, the lectures are up here, and the class notes the C3S1, I think, has moved, but it's also been uh, greatly enhanced. So you might want to download this if you want to follow along in class. So that's, that's a much enhanced version. That actually has sections 1, 2, and 3. My guess is, is that <clears throat> we'll probably do sections 1 and 2 today, but not 3 or at least not all of three. So I'll probably break out three as another section, because it's actually a very important section and pretty long. So you can take a look at or we'll download that particular file for today's class. So I'm going to go in, and uh, here I've, um, no, I haven't. Uh, so I want to go into chapter three, and I'm going to bring up this file. I'll now, I'm going to clear the console from the last class, and I'm going to set the working directory to Chapter 3 of Stat 523 notes. And we'll go over to the workplace, and I'm actually going to get rid of this. <coughs> so we start out with a clean slate. So download it and then upload it if you want to follow along. I'm also going to create the HTML. So we're going to be talking about object-oriented systems in R, and there are actually six object-oriented systems in R, but the two that are built in are S3 and S4 class, the, the S3 and S4 class system, which we're going to focus on in this course. Now the S3 class system is uh, kind of informally defined, and it's very easy to learn. And therefore, probably 90% of the packages that people have written probably use S3 classes. S4 classes are far more formal. Um, and in particular, if you're looking at this book, as we get into more topics in bioinformatics, it turns out that Bioconductor, which is the big project dealing with bioinformatics, uses S4 classes. All of the packages in the Bioconductor project use S4 classes. So it's not as if we can just say, well, I'm just going to learn S3 classes. I don't really need to mess with S4 classes. But in fact, you do if, if you're doing genomics, and proteomics, and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, But we're going to learn some of each in this chapter. Now, I might mention that um, it turns out that um, there's a new book, uh, I think it's called Learning R. I'll, I'll put a reference up for it because it's actually an easier introduction into R than this book. Uh, it doesn't go as deep. On the other hand, uh, it has some interesting topics and it's a little more up to date. It, John Chambers was responsible for writing all of the, you know, he's, he's sort of one of the original authors of the uh, S system, which underlies R. And he has developed, he has developed the object systems, the S3 and the S4, along with other people. I think it, uh, Trevor Hasty helped him develop the S3 system, but he developed the S4 system, and it's been described as a little bit uh, clunky and a little bit difficult. Uh, 
And S3 is very easy, but, um, but it's not so reliable. So there's this trade-off between reliability and ease of use, where S3 is very easy to use, but it's not necessarily very reliable. S4 is reliable, but it's hard, fairly hard to learn and to use. And so John Chambers is actually uh, writing a new book with a new object system called a reference system, which apparently makes things a lot better. And the question will be, uh, for example, will, will, the bio will the people in the bioconductor project say, well, we have 600 packages and we're going to rewrite them such that they're in this new object system. Uh, I kind of doubt that, uh, at least in the short term, unless there's an easy transition to do that. Uh, it turns out that there is a transition from the S3 class to the S4, so perhaps John Chambers is um, going to build that in. Now, I should mention that John Chambers is writing a book on this new class system, but um, it's not yet published, at least I don't think it is. So once, and so I'm hesitant, um, I'm hesitant to start talking about this other reference system when it's A, not widely used or documented. It may in the future, if it's as good as some people think it is, then it may be used a lot more. The other object system I want to mention, um, and, and I want to just sort of back up to the last section of the second chapter. It talks about graphics, and I presented a few graphics, but what I didn't talk about, and I should put a little bit in the notes on this, is that there are different, just like there are different object systems, there are different graphic systems. And the book mentions uh, the graphics class is sort of the built-in classical class. When you say plot, for example, you're using the, the graphics sort of classical system that's been there from the beginning. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the hist for histograms and so forth, a lot of, a lot of those derive from these original, um, th these original um, graphics environments. And it so happens that the that the, the graphics system that's sort of built in the original one is actually built on S3 object classes. So originally it wasn't built on any classes, but it was sort of retrofitted to the S3 object classes. <clears throat> but then, um, but then um, uh, there were some limitations to the, the this graphics system, and so um, um, Paul Morell wrote a system called GRID, and GRID is a more sophisticated graphic system that can do a lot more. And then there was a guy who wrote a group of, a group of uh, types of graphs uh, called the Lattice Package, but it actually builds on GRID. So in other words, you have to have GRID before you can build lat Lattice. Now, later on, I'll show you some examples of, the, of these different systems. Uh, we actually have a course, Stat 525, which talks about these graphic systems, which, which is a course that I'm going to revamp at some point because um, last time I, the technology has changed so much since then. I was focused on, on both the classical graphic system, the one time I taught it, maybe I taught it twice, and then the, uh, I also talked about the grid and the lattice packages, but I also talked about another class that did dynamic graphics which somehow hasn't taken off. Um, <clears throat> one of the frustrating things for me is um, there was a LISP-based system back in the late 80s. There was a whole bunch of excitement based upon the LISP programming environment for doing statistics. And one of the systems that was built by Luke Tierney at the University, of, he was at the time at the University of Minnesota, uh, was called Exostat, which was a statistics system built on LISP. And from the very beginning, um, you, would, you were able, as you could, actually develop dynamic graphics. That's never been very easy to do in R. At best, it's clunky. Um, and so R has not had a particularly good system for doing dynamic graphics. There have been several attempts. All of these attempts for doing dynamic graphics have been based upon the X11 windering system for Unix. And in particular, they've based, been based upon other Unix types tools like Qt and there are other tools that have been used. And therefore, it makes it hard for the average person, if they're not kind of Unix savvy, to do these interactive graphics. And so that's, that's been a, um, that's 
been a bit of a problem. So let me just mention, um, when we're talking about graphic system, um, there was a um, there was an environment created by um, a guy named Wilkinson, um, and he wrote a book called The Grammar of Graphics, and he actually introduced this system into the S SPSS statistical system. At the time, he was working for SPSS. And so the Grammar of Graphics was then re-implemented in ORI by a guy named Hadley Wicken, and that's called ggplot2, and it is a very, very good system. The only problem is <clears throat> ggplot2... Um, is incredibly flexible, but again, it's a little bit difficult to use. You don't, <clears throat> it, it, it takes a bit more knowledge than if you say plot in the regular gra graphic system, or if you say hist. In other words, the regular graphic system is very simple to use, but it's a bit more limited in some of these other systems. I want to mention um, one other graphic system that uh, has been developed in our studio called Shiny. How many of you know how to use a spreadsheet like Excel? Put your hand up. Okay. How many, well, I'll take it that the ones that didn't raise their hand don't know. Okay. <clears throat> um, so at any rate, did you hear the thing about Mark Train where the teacher says, Anyone who's an idiot, I want you to stand up. <laughs> and Samuel Clements um, was sitting there, and she was staring at him. So eventually he stood up. She said, so you're an idiot. He says, no, I'm not an idiot, but I just didn't want you to be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> to the teacher. At any rate, um, um, at any rate, uh, Excel, if you don't know it, or some other spreadsheet, and Google Docs is a spreadsheet, and Apple's iWork is a spreadsheet, so forth. <laughs> so there, and there's open source, there are open source spreadsheets that are available. And actually, some of the open source are very good because they actually allow you to bet, embed R within those spreadsheets. Technically, you can also do it in Excel. You can embed R within Excel. But having said that, um, when you design like a table, it, it turns out that you can define formulas, right? So if you change the value of a particular cell, it can cause a ripple effect on the other cells. Okay. Do you know what that's called? You know, I change one cell and it causes a ripple effect. So, for example, I have a table, and I have the sums of the rows and the columns, and I change an entry. If I have a table, and I have sums of the rows and sums of the columns, and I change the cell, what happens? Then the row sum and the column sum for that cell change, right? That's a simple example. If you were doing power calculations, and you had certain parameters, and you wanted to see what is the effect on power if I change those parameters, then again, that would be an example of what I'm talking about. Do you know what this is called? It's a type of program. It's called reactive programming. I make a change as a reaction. It turns out there's a graphical system um, uh, that's been developed within our by the our studio folks uh, where you actually have a web page and a graph appears, and you can control it with sliders and things like that. And what's really happening is, as you control the slider on the client side, and this is embedded to say, in, in a web page, then, in fact, it sends a message to the server side. It tells you to recompute it, and then it sends back, and it, it updates the client picture. So you can actually have interactive graphics in Shiny, S-H-I-N-Y. And, and if you look at our studio, the documentation, you can see how to use it, because it's pretty cool. There is a slight delay. It's not as interactive if you're all native. It's not that interactive, but it's, it, it, if you have a fairly fast connection, it's pretty interactive. So I make a change on the client in my web page and it sends it back. Now the other methods for doing um, for doing uh, interactive graphics on in HTML, and let's assume there's one way you can do it, and that's if you have Java applets. So if you have Java applets, basically that's native to the client. 
Now, the problem is, is that people increasingly are doing away with Java. They're using Java extensively on the server side. But on the client side, people are sort of getting away from Java applets. And the reason is, is because of security. And so, um, it's not to say, I mean, I, we've done quite a few applets. And we still have applets, but it's, it's something that it could keep you awake at night. You know. Because every time Oracle announces they have a vulnerability, then all our applets in teaching step 211, for example. Now the problem is, is my, what my worry is not, so, is not so much that, it's the fact that Apple will just immediately disenable you from using those applets. And so mm -hmm. I, I, my real worry is that suddenly the applets won't work until we upgrade. And so that's uh, the bigger worry I have, that I'll get a phone call. None of our applets work, and we're in the middle of an exam. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> so and anyway, so uh, applets are something that you can do interactively, and they're native, but the problem is, is that there are issues with it. So HTML and JavaScript is another way. And it turns out Shiny can be controlled by JavaScript, and therefore you could argue that, um, uh, I would argue that, you know, if you're learning statistics, that you better learn to program. Because if you don't, you're very limited. And so um, the question is, is it enough to learn how to program in R, which is what we're doing? And some of you are learning to program in SAS, which is not a true programming language. You're mainly programming the data step. Most of you won't learn how to write procs. Any of you taken 521? Did you write new procs, procedures? No. You learned the data step, right? And it's very powerful. But if you wanted to write a new procedure, why do you think R caught on? Because it allows you to write, you know, you do research, you develop new methodologies, and you implement it in R. And you can do it at a high level. And that's why there are thousands and thousands of packages, because everyone that does research, almost, creates an R package. So uh, I just want to mention one more thing. Um, I mentioned that the basic plots use the S3 paradigm for uh, object orientation, but it, it's, based upon the cons it's based upon the concept of a device. Now, if, if I create a window that's a graph, that's a device. If I create another window, with another graph, that's another device. So I can have multiple windows open, and I can move among them. But if I do another plot, by default, if I create a plot and I do another one, it replaces the previous plot. But I can actually create more devices, and I can not only create them, and so there's a bunch of commands they talk about, dev dot something, like dev dot cur for the current device, or DEV dot next for the next device because there's a there's a precedence that if I create if I go to the next device there's a certain order to the devices which typically is the order in which you create them and so I can move around these devices and I can even interact with them a little bit there's there are a couple of functions that to let you interact with them like locate a point so there's a there's a couple of things you can do but you're pretty limited in interactivity with the current with, with the classical graphics objects or types of graphs. So take a look at that in, in um, you know, at the last part of uh, the last section of the previous chapter. So I want to talk about, again, I've talked about S3 and S4. And so what do we mean by object oriented programming? Well, obviously, there are objects, and so in some sense, we act upon them. But what is an object? Um, well, the object encapsulates the state information. And it will be a member of a class. So that, um, and, and the class itself describes the properties of those objects. Now, two objects of the same class have the same, same properties, but they just differ in the state information. Now, you can also define methods related to, that act upon these objects. In other words, we have to, in other words, it's not enough just to create these structures. There are types of data structures. So we create these structures um, that tell, the, 
contains the um, information in a particular object, but we also have to have methods for acting on that on those classes. I didn't actually put that up there, but I should. But we also have inheritance. Uh, and that allows you to define classes in, um, built upon tops of other classes. And so this saves a lot of time. And so um, if you think about statistics, if you think about GLM, which is generalized linear model, and you think about LM, well, GLM extends LM. In other words, a linear model, a generalized linear model is an extension of a linear model. So a linear model is a type of generalized linear model, but not all generalized linear models are linear. So if we think about, uh, if we think about it, um, it's very useful to be able to do this, and I'll show you an example in a minute. We also have polymorphism, and this is where you have generic functions defined, and generic functions look at their arguments, and based upon the classes of their arguments, they, they decide which method to use. So if I say plot, if I take plot, it's actually a generic function. And the type of plot you get depends typically on the first argument. There are some cases in which it may depend on the first two arguments, but generally speaking, uh, if I have an S3 class and I have a generic function, the actual, what the graph looks like depends upon the class of that first argument. So if I say plot of an object that's numeric, it will be a histogram, but if it's categorical, it'll be a bar chart. Now, it turns out, um, I've already mentioned, you know, that the instances of class only differ by the state information. That is, what we call the slots associated with the class to contain the actual information or the data. Um, and the way you define new classes in terms of existing classes is through inheritance. So we have an inherited system. And uh, a language can have single inheritance or it can have multiple inheritance. S3 has single inheritance. You can't have something inheriting from two other classes in S3, but you can in S4. There's also the concept, oh, in S3, I have a simple tree. I can always trace from the object back to the root object, or back to the root class. And so in, in S3, I can always very simply resolve, uh, I can resolve things by going up the tree structure. But this can be more difficult in like S4, which not only has multiple inheritance, but it has what's called multiple dispatch. So what is dispatch? And I'll talk about this some more in a moment. Again, if I say plot, plot, P-O-O-T, which is a generic function in, in the base graphics system, and I, I have a numeric vector, it will do a histogram by default. It dispatches that method. But if it's categorical, if it's a factor, it will dispatch, it won't do a histogram. Histograms are numeric data, right? It will do a bar chart. So that, again, S3 is single dispatch, whereas S4 allows multiple dispatch. And in fact, S4 allows you to dispatch on multiple arguments. So you might guess that S4 is a lot more difficult than S3, and it is, if you really get into it. Well, when we go into this chapter, we're going to, um, let's see. we're going to need some libraries, and um, if you want to load like the uh, R Bio M, uh, that particular package is in the Bioconductor, and so you have to go to bioconductor.org and you have to read the directions about how you install classes because it's a little bit different than installing classes uh, through the basic R system. So, um, so you might want to go to bioconductor.org to learn how to install these classes, but in order to install that first one, you're going to need to do that.
So bioconductor.org is like a whole new world universe for doing bioinformatics. And it's something we're going to be focusing on more and more as we go through the course. We're co-teaching this with STAT 423, which is actually called Bioinformatics Computing. And in fact, um, and that's, but my idea was, um, at least until we get, we're actually developing a, we're actually developing a Bachelor of Science degree um, <clears throat> called Computational Biology. It's a joint degree between biology, mathematics, and statistics. And we actually have a track we have two tracks, one that's more focused towards the biology and one more towards the math stat. But there are two tracks, but there's a common core of knowledge. And the 423 actually will be a required course in that program. So this is sort of my trial run. Um, so if I load this, it is loaded. It is loaded on, on, on rstudio.stat.w.edu, but uh, if you try this on your system and you're not on studio.stat, you're probably going to have to figure out how to install it. And then the graph, uh, the library graph, rgraph this, and library methods, you might notice that if I go over here and actually look at what happened, um, that, that when I loaded the rbioinf, it actually requires the graph package. And so uh, it's at any rate, it's loading here anyway, and then this R graph viz actually requires the grid. I talked a little while ago about grid as a graphic system as one of the alternatives to the base graphic system, and in fact, the R graph viz, which lets you do some interesting things, uh, requires grid. Grid lets you do things. Um, suppose you wanted to draw a network. By network, I mean nodes and connections between the nodes. Okay, so you might talk about a gene interaction network, and so you have genes represented by circles, and you have, you may have directional errors showing the relationship between the genes, and so we would need some graphic system for drawing this representation, and that's something you can do in our graph this. And then there's a library called methods. So these are things you need later on in the chapter, not necessarily in what we're going to do today. So you might want to might want to um, to do that. Well, it's a little bit abstract for me to be talking about about this without giving an example. So let's consider that you are given a job of <clears throat> you, you you need to represent airline passengers for an airline, and you need to um, ultimately you're going to need to represent whether or not they're a frequent flyer or not. And if so, what is their frequent flyer number? So uh, I'm going to create I'm going to create a class called Passenger. So so I have a class called Passengers, and so for every passenger every passenger is going to be a unique instance of this class. So what do you need to measure? As a minimum, what do you need? You're going to need more than this. <clears throat> but you're going to need the name of the person, and you're going to need the origin of where they start from and where they're flying to. So the destination. So at a minimum, you're going to need that. So let's let's define this class. And notice how we did it. The actual data, and we call those slots. There are actually three slots: name, origin, and destination. Now it's we we do this by a we do this with a function representation, well, which we call representation. So we have representation, and then we list the slots and the values. Slots, value, slot, value. So we have the representation, we have the name slot, we have the origin slot, and the destination slot. And what we're saying is that the name is a character vector, and that the origin is character, and the destination is character. So those are all of type character. So if I say get the class of passengers, so if I run this now, <clears throat> you can see that this was defined in the global space. And why wasn't it defined in the global space? Um, it's in there. Uh, when I do a particular instance of it, it will be there. 
but it's not did I you know I did set this correctly I think okay so if I say get class that just gives a summary information and in the OS system they call it slots which uh, corresponds to the actual data. Now, slots is a term that was used by LISP, and so this has uh, been used also in ORA. As I said, that ORA is a lot LISP-like, and so it uses a lot of the terminology from this. <clears throat> so you can see that, yeah, you can see the summary that we have for passengers. Now, suppose we want to find a frequent flyer. Now, a frequent flyer is also a passenger, right? Now, a passenger may not be a frequent flyer, but a frequent flyer is always a passenger. So, <clears throat> so I, can, I can define a frequent flyer class, but notice that I'm saying that it contains passenger. In other words, my representation only defines the additional information. So I'm defining the additional information. So what is the relationship between these two classes now? So let's say get class for frequent flyer. So if I get class, now magically, the slots, name, origin, and destination are also part of it because I use the word contains. <clears throat> so anyone that is a frequent flyer is a passenger. But again, a passenger may not be a frequent flyer. So if I look at a subclass, in other words, frequent flyer is more specific. And so therefore, it's considered to be a subclass of passenger. Frequent flyer is a subclass. And on the other hand, a superclass of frequent flyer is passenger. So that, notice I say subclass names. And there could be one. The reason names is plural is because there could be uh, there, could, there could be more than one subclass. And then the superclass names of frequent flyer will be passenger. So I have defined uh, I've defined two classes, but frequent flyer is is more specific in that it's it also specifies the frequent flyer number if in fact the person is a frequent flyer. Otherwise, they're not a member of that class because you have to specify the numeric. Well, let me come back to, um, before we define method, um, I want to talk about dispatch. And I've mentioned dispatch before. So dispatch is a specialized function uh, that can be applied to an instant of one or more classes. And so the, the process, I'm sorry, did I say dispatch as a method? A method is a specialized function that applies to the instances of one or more classes. And in the process of determining the appropriate method to actually call, is called dispatch. And that was the example I gave that, um, you know, with plot, that the way we dispatch depends upon the first argument. And that's true for S3 classes, but it's more complicated for S4 in general. So suppose I'm going to create a method right here. And what this method is, is going to print, it's, it's actually a kind of a, well, if I, if I create, if I create an object and I, and I, and I just specify that object, uh, it prints it with a default method. But if I actually, um, I want to make a nicer print. I want to make a nicer print rather than just um, give it a default print. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a, a, a set method. We're going to define a method called show. This is a method associated with passenger. And so uh, this is actually a function. It's a, in other words, a method is a special type of function. So here's the function. Function depends upon an object. 
And in order to do this, it would have to be an object of type passenger. So if I say so if I say show, I maybe I've written the show function for other classes. And in fact we're gonna do that for the you know for the frequent flyer class. I think we're gonna do that. So the function center says cat. Can cat concatenates? It concatenates character strings. So what it's gonna do is concatenate name colon, and then it's going to bring in object at name. The at sign actually says, for the object, extract the slot called name. So the at sign is an extraction operator that extracts the slot from the object. So if I have a particular, I'm going to define a particular passenger called P1, passenger 1, P1. And if I want to extract that name of that object, then it would be like P1 at name. But here I don't know the name of the, I'm writing it generically. So the point is, is that object could be any object that's a passenger, any passenger I pass for. It's going to extract the name of that passenger. And it's going to concatenate it to the string I'm building up uh, that starts out with name, then it has the name of the passenger. And then slash n says new line, go to the next line. I'm going to make it pretty. So I want, I want the name to be on one line, the origin to be on one line, destination to be on one line. So, so I go to the next line. Then I say cat. I'm going to cat the origin colon with a colon, and then I'm going to extract the slot origin from the object that I've passed to it. And then I do the same thing with destination. So that's a function that I've defined. So let's run that. So that develops a method, a method called show associated with the passenger class. And it, it operates on instances of that class. Now let's define a passenger. So here we say, I want a new passenger. It's going to create an instance of passenger. This is how you create objects. And the name of it is jbiologist. The origin is uh, yxy, and the destination is tgl. You could put abbreviations, pit, for airport names, of course. So we define a new passenger. And what does, if I say P1, then actually P1 invokes this method, show. And so notice I have name, colon, J biologist, or in colon, and so forth. So I invoke this show method by simply saying P1. So um, this is pretty nice. Now in reality, where would the information for passengers be? You're not going to type in all the information for all the passengers. Where are they going to be? They're going to be in a database, right? Some place is a database with maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of passengers. And so what we need is some interface between Aura and the database to pull database in. And then once we've done that, we need some interface between what we bring in from the database and how we create an object of a particular class. So all of this can be done. Later on in the book, we'll look at some, I think we'll get to it, I believe it's in chapter eight maybe. Um, we're, going to, um, we're going to actually read in from a database and from that we should be able to manipulate it in such a way that we can create, uh, say, an object of class passenger if we wanted to do that. Our interfaces with almost everything. Now, during evaluation, during evaluation, um, you, you can, um, control can be passed in the function, control can be passed to a less specific uh, method. So let's create a show for frequent flyer. So what I want to do is create a, uh, a show method for frequent flyer. So I have function object, and it says call next method. Well, what is the next method? It's that show function we just did for passenger, because the passenger is less specific. So I'm actually calling 
Um, this saves me redefining. In other words, this saves me from redefining these three because when I say call next method, that passenger is the passenger is the next method. That is, it's I go to this method associated with the next with the superclass and its passenger. And so um, I get that for free. And the only thing I have to add is a cat for frequent flyer, which is the frequent flyer number. And then I extract from it um, the frequent flyer number and print it. So let's take this method and let's, let's execute it. And so now I've defined a method, a more specialized method, that prints out not only the general information for passengers, but also the frequent flyer number. And so if I now create a passenger 2, who happens to be a frequent flyer, and so um, we have a, we're creating a new frequent flyer, a new instance of frequent flyer class, and I have the same information. Well, I have biologist, and then I give LAX actually is Los Angeles. And so I'm going to create this new passenger. We do this. And now when we print it out, it also gives the frequent flyer number. So. See how I'm doing. Okay. Now prior to, if you look at the C programming languages and the, the, the concept of structures and things like that existed. And what, what we could call those concepts abstract data types. But here's the problem. You'd like to separate out in an abstract data type like the representation from the interface to that representation. The representation is actually how you structure it and store it in your computer. The interface is how you access it. Now, if I wanted to change the representation, what I don't want to have to do is rewrite all my code that depends upon that particular representation. But if I create an abstract interface to it, then I can change the representation and use the same interface to get to, the, uh, to, to my data. Now, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about for example, um, genomics data, in particular microarray data, has a data structure called an expression set. And an expression set is quite complicated. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But it contains the output of microarray data, but a lot more. And so um, <clears throat> if I want to access this microarray data, I can do it through expression sets. But if I then decided that I wanted to change this expression set a bit, because of the interface, I wouldn't have to rewrite all the code for everything that depends upon this particular representation. And that's sort of the idea. Now, it turns out object-oriented object -oriented programming using classes sort of all automatically describes these abstract data structure and methods that operate on them. And so um, we might want to represent what we did previously a little differently, for example. And so let's take a look. In other words, I can think of object-oriented program as providing a set of tools that lets me represent abstract data types. Now, you can do it in other ways that are not based upon object-oriented programming. So other languages that are not object-oriented still let you do abstract data types. So let's consider, how would you represent a rectangle? Well, I'm going to sort of do it in kind of a silly way now. And it's silly because I'm going to represent it uh, with three slots, the height, the width, and the area. Why is that silly? I don't really need the area, right? Because I can compute it by the height times the width. But let's go along with it. So I'm going to set class rectangle, and the representation is going to be H, W, and area. Those are the slots. So let's, let's define a, a class called rectangle. 
And then I'm going to create a rectangle, my, rec my R for rectangle. And that says, that says the height is 10 and the width is 20 and the area is 200, 10 times 20. Now what I'm going to do is to find a generic function called area. Now setting a method called area is not the same thing as making it a generic function. So I'm going to make it a generic function. And so for example, if I type in plot, um, this says this is a standard generic plot defined for the package graphics. And this gives the actual function. And then I could say show methods plot to see what the currently available ones are. So here are the types of things you can do. So you can have x as a factor, y as an integer, and so forth. There, there are things that you can do. But in fact, this isn't so useful. So it says x is any and y is any. If you, look at, if you look at some common books on the basic R graphics, you'll see what you can really do um, in terms of the flexibility you have. OK, let's come back. If I define, if I define area as a generic function, notice I'm using standard generic. It just returns area. It says it's a generic function. Now I'm going to define a method for area. And what this method is simply going to do, it's going to extract the area slot from shape. So the function shape, OK, it's a function of one argument called shape. And for shape, it extracts the area. So if I say set method, that also returns it. Now, if I, my rectangle is an, ob, is, an, is an instance of class rectangle. And I can extract its slot simply by saying my or at, uh, at area. And, and that will return the area of 10. But I could also now do it with the function area. So if I say function my rectangle, it also returns 20. Now the only thing, the only thing this function is doing is calling the slot. So if you, if you actually look right here, the only thing the function is doing is I'm passing at this object my, right here, uh, my r, and it simply extracts a slot. Now this isn't really what you want to do. You really want to compute it, right? So how would I change this? Now suppose, well, again, I'm I'm just showing two ways that you can get the area. One is just since it's a slot, I can just I can just uh, um, extract the slot from the object and it prints out, or I can call the generic function area to also get it. But now suppose you want to change the representation. In other words, we don't need area as a slot because we can compute it, right? We don't need it. So let's um, if I say get the class of rectangle. It's printing out rectangle, uh, and it says these are the slots. It's class rectangle, and those are the slots for that class. Now suppose I say set rectangle, but now, I, in other words, I'm changing the class definition for rectangle to only contain two slots, H and W, no longer area. So I change, I change this class representation. And now let's say, now if I say, get class of rectangle. Notice that it's still called rectangle, but now it, does, it has two slots. It doesn't have the area as a third slot. So I've redefined this. Now let me redefine the method for area. What I'm now going to do is define a function shape, which takes the h slot and multiplies it times the w slot, in other words, width times height. And so it's, it's, create, it's computing the area rather than 
I mean, you certainly don't want to give the area. You'd have to multiply it each time and just put that in. That's something computers are good at, so let's make a method to do it, not just extract a slot, which you would have had to compute by hand or something. So, um, so I'm going to set this method. And now when I call, now when I call, um, now when I call, um, if I set the method, notice I didn't, I didn't have to redo the generic function. That's, that's already done. I did not have to redo it. I redefined the method, and then I created a new rectangle that just has H and W slots called my MR. And then it said, and then I printed out my MR. <coughs> um, my MR is an object request rectangle that has two slots. Um, and then if I compute the area of my MR is 200. It's now actually computing it internally using the method area, which is a, which is also a generic function. Okay, so that's a very simple example of how you might. Um, how you might do this, and so this um, I don't know if this this just gives you a slight introduction to this. Now these are examples of um, of S four classes. So, um, a lot of times, if you have a data frame, well, okay, if you have a matrix, now a matrix is restricted that all the elements have to be of the same type, all numeric, all character, all logical, whatever, and you can name, um, you can name the rows and the columns, and that's called metadata, but you can't do a lot else. If you have a data frame, it's sort of the same thing. You can name the rows and the columns, but you can't do a lot else. So a lot of times, you would like to have you would like to have a um, you would like to have a structure that's self-describing. That is, it contains its own documentation. So I had mentioned I mentioned previously expression set. Expression set is a data structure. It's defined in the BioBase package in Bioconductor, the project Bioconductor. And the idea is that you not only want to control, you want not only want to include the data, in this case the microarray data that's output, but you also want to include a lot of metadata, not just like row names or column names, but in additional things. And so this is what this is what you can do. So you can define these rich data structures that also contain metadata. Metadata is data about data. So it gives us information about the data we have. And so uh, that's something that expression set allows you a fairly rich structure that defines the metadata. Now it turns out that, you know, as in terms of expression set, as the technology evolves, and in bioinformatics, the technology is evolving very quickly. It may be that you want more metadata as you move along in time. You may have additional things you want to put in the expression set. Now, the idea is that if an expression set is an abstract data set, then I should be able to enrich it. And if I, as long as the interface, as long as I haven't changed the interface to it, I should it shouldn't break my code of everything that's built upon using the expression set data structure as long as I have an interface that hasn't changed how my, where our methods act upon that data. Now you may define new methods that use this new type of data. That's fine. It's just you don't, you don't want to break every pack. You don't, if the core team doing bioconductor changes and they, say adds some metadata, you don't want to break every package in bioconductor because you sort of enrich the data structure. The technical reasons why you would want to do that. Okay. Well, we're going to get started uh, a little bit on S3 classes.
so we're going to cover uh, S3 classes in this section, and then we're going to go into S4 classes. Now, S3 classes, as I mentioned, are um, they're by far the easier of the two. And on this reliability versus ease of use scale, um, the S3 is definitely on the ease of use, but <clears throat> not as reliable. I should also mention that um, S3 heavily depends upon the use of generic functions. And it less heavily depends upon the class structure and the inheritance. Whereas S4 also depends upon generic functions, but, it, but it's much more oriented towards the class structure. So you can actually, it's not just you can represent classes that are pretty rich, it actually checks for consistency that, in fact, if you define a class that has a certain slots of certain types, then, in fact, you better have that or you'll get an error, whereas in S3 you may not. So it's easier to make mistakes in S3. You have to make sure and do internal checking um, to make sure you haven't made a mistake. Okay. Um, I did want to mention that there are some classes that are called internal or implicit and others defined by class S attributes. So um, we're going to talk about these implicitly defined. For example, matrix is, is implicitly defined. as A lot of the original objects in R before there was a class structure are and they're even more primitive objects or objects like matrix that existed well before we had an object system in R. Um, they're, in, they're now implicitly the, the class structure is now implicit. It got sort of baked into it. Um, but there are some pitfalls that you'll see uh, later on um, by these implicitly defined classes. So function is an implicit class, as is matrix, as is array. So there are some of these basic data structures are, in, are implicit, not explicit. Now, the class... the uh, the class attribute, it's a vector of character vectors. It tells the inheritance, and it's linear. So you might have a class of GOM, which inherits also from LM. So for example, um, if I look at my free, if I were doing S3 classes for frequent flyer and passengers, then frequent flyer would precede in, in the hierarchy passengers, because it's, you go from the more specific to the less specific. So in the order would have frequent flyer first, then passenger, because frequent flyer is more specific. From it goes from the more specific to the less specific. So uh, let's just take a look at how you can sort of do things here um, in S3 classes. So suppose I suppose I create I just create a vector one to ten. Now you know that if I at this point if I simply type in x, I get that vector, right? And if I look at the class of it, it's a class integer. Now, suppose I take x and I restructure it with the date into a matrix with the dimension command. So I restructure it as a 2, two by 5 matrix. So I'm restructuring it, and now I look at the class, and now suddenly it's a class matrix of restructuring. Now, again, these are sort of internal explicit classes. If I look at the attributes of class, why didn't I get, why didn't I get matrix? The pro now, this is one of the pitfalls. The problem is, when I look at attributes, it does not list the implicit classes. Even though the class of X is a matrix, when I... Um, when I specify it, uh, let me, oh, I didn't mean to do that. What I meant to do is type in x. You see, it, it gives the data, but it doesn't say the attributes below it and say the class attribute is matrix. It's not given. It just prints the matrix. That's all. And that's for convenience. That is, you don't necessarily, when you, when you say print out a matrix, you don't necessarily want to print out the attributes of that matrix. And the attribute, um, the attribute um, could have been a, a matrix attribute representing the class, but 
Uh, but that's not done for these implicit or built-in classes. So if I simply said the attributes of x, and you'd say, oh, there is, if I simply did that and didn't say class of x, you'd say, oh, there is no class, but there is actually. Now, if I, if I say, um, going back to here, x is no longer a matrix, is no longer an integer. So if I say inheritance is where you can actually find out what, whether or not this is an instance of what, x is no longer an instance of, of integer because I converted it from an integer to a matrix using the dimension function. And on the other hand, it is a matrix. So I can't find out what the class is from the attribute, but I can find out from inherits. So does x inherit from matrix? Yes. Matrix is an implicit function. So how would you, how would you define, if we take our uh, example of frequent flyer and um, passenger, how would we define this within the S3 class environment? Because previously we did it in S4. How would we define it in S3? Um, you would do something like this. If I define x to be a list, and we often use a list when we're doing S3 classes to represent the slots. So I'm going to define the name, the origin, and destination in X, and that's a list. If I say class of, if I say the class of X is a passenger, and then I click on X, it gives the slots. By the way, you know, previously I, I defined that show function, which printed out a little needed in this, and that was actually the purpose of doing that method called show that I did with the S4 classes. So, um, so I've defined X to be a list which has these named objects here, named elements within the list, and then I define the class of X to be, uh, to be passenger. Now I'm going to define, I'm going to define another list, but it also has a frequent flyer number, and then. If I look at the, I'm going to decline, define the class to be what? Well, notice that I've defined it to be frequent flyer, but I haven't told it any place that this is, you know, that, that this is a superclass of this, and this is the way you do it. So I'm saying that yes, it's a, it's it's a class frequent flyer, but that inherits from passenger. So if we print out y. We see we also now uh, we also now get the frequent flyer number, and we can see the attribute is now frequent flyer and passenger. So when I create a class, it's going to print out this attribute, but that's not the case for these implicit classes. So you have to be careful. So does does X inherit from passenger? Yes. Does X inherit from frequent flyer? No. Does Y inherit from passenger? Yes. Does Y inherit from frequent flyer? Yes. See, Y is a frequent flyer, which also means it's a, it inherits from passenger. But this was very informally defined. What am I doing time-wise? This was very informally. Um, this was very informally defined. So. So I want to introduce a function called isObject. It tests whether or not an R object has a class attribute. So if I, cre if I create x again, I'm going back into redefining x to be 1 to 10. And is it an object? No, it is not. If I print x out, it just prints out the vector. It doesn't print out the attribute, the class attribute. On the, on the other hand, if I now say I want the class of x to be my integer, or my int, then I do that, and then I say, is it an object? Yes, it's true. 
And if I print out x now, what happens? It not only prints out the vector, it prints out the class attribute. So again, I defined, uh, I defined an S3 class here simply by using the class function. And that's a lot less formal than once you do in S4 classes, as you saw earlier. So is object is a good way you can test to see if an object is a member of a particular class. So. Well, we talked about implicit, implicit, um, or, um, we, we talked about uh, some of the primitive or basic classes do not use the class attribute that we've seen. And I mentioned that functions and, and closures are implicitly a class function. So that's an implicit class sort of built in or baked into R. And when we wrote functions in chapter two, you may have seen that you saw the function closure, that it's a type function and gave the closure. So let's take a look. Let's do a 1 to 10 again. I'm going to use the matrix argument. And I'm going to take, I'm going to say I want two columns, 1 to 10, and I want two columns. So at th this point, if I print out x, it prints it out as, as a matrix. Now I'm going to define it. I'm going to define it as a class. And then if I print it out, in this case, because it's an implicit class, it is not going to print out the attributes. It, it's not an object, but if I say old class of x equals matrix, that's, that's a function which lets me redefine uh, x now to have the matrix. This is one way you can take these built-in things and kind of convert them into S3 type classes that give the, that give the option, in this case, matrix. So now if I say is object of x, it's true. So the primitive functions like matrix, function, array, some of these primitives uh, can trick you up. Because they don't always have the class attribute. They don't, and so uh, even though it's implicitly there, you don't actually see it written out. So it's just something you have to be careful of. Okay. So I have a couple minutes. I'm going to I'm going to look at I'm going to look at this is actually a problem. I'm going to look at the GLM function for doing a, what's called a Poisson regression. But it has some interesting functions here. Suppose I'm going to create suppose I'm I'm a researcher and I collect this count data. It could be species counts. Um, so you might have a count representing species counts, and so you notice those are all whole numbers. And so I create counts, and of course counts is just a vector. And now um, there's a function um, there's a function called GL for group levels, and if you type in the help file for this. So if you type in the help file for GL, if you want to create factors for a factorial experiment, then I can generate factor levels based upon, based upon n, k, and the length, which is optional. By default, it's n times k, where n is, um, gives the number of levels, and k gives the number of applications for that. <clears throat> so if I define, if I define outcome, to have three levels replicated once, but for a total of nine, it will be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And so now um, I'm going to do that, and then let's look at outcome. I just generated one, two, three, um, three times. And now I'm going to do the same thing of treatment, except I have three and three. And so this says that I want the one, two, three to be replicated three times. So the one gets replicated three times, the two gets replicated three, and so forth. 
So let's look at treatment. And let's look what it looks like. So it's 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. So I have nine observations. So the 18, now I have two factors now. So I'm going to do a two-way, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to do a generalized linear model with two factors. And so 18 has, um, for, out, for outcome, it's level 1. And for a treatment, it's level 1. So that 18, you line them up. So it's level one and level one. If I think of a matrix going one, two, three, one, two, three, and so the rows maybe represent the treatment and the columns represent the outcomes. In the one, one position, I have 18. Okay. Um, and then the 17, the 17 says that's level two of outcome, but still level one of treatment. You see what I've done? and so forth. So that's my data. And now I'm going to fit a model to see if there's any effect. Oh, well, first of all, I'm going to create a data frame. And then you're going to see what this looks like now. So this is what my data, this is, we actually created the data that says 18, if I look at treatment one and outcome, uh, I have treat one, outcome one is 18, treat one, outcome two is 17, treat one, outcome three, and so forth. Treatment two, outcome one. I have no replications of my data. I have nine cells, and I have nine observations. So I, have, I don't have one one appearing more than once, which you very well might want to do if you wanted to. If you wanted to look at an interaction between treatment and outcome, you would have to do that. Uh, but at any rate, so I'm going to do a two-way analysis of variance. Except it's not an analysis of variance. It's going to be a generalized linear model because I'm not going to assume that the error terms are normal. I'm going to assume that they're sum. So if I assume that counts, counts you typically think of as, well, the first thing that might come to mind if I have a count and I don't have an upper bound on that count is the Poisson distribution. Because it deals with counts per unit area, per unit time, whatever. So I might have a quadrant, and based upon that quadrant, I'm measuring the count of a certain species. Well, I mean, there is an upper limit in practice, but it might not be small. So, um, so if you're a biologist, for example, you might have quadrants, and within each quadrant, you are sampling. You want to know how many, how many of each of a particular species do I find in that quadrant. And then um, the treatments and outcomes could relate to how you treat these different quadrants. At any rate, I can run, I can now run GOM.G93 as a function GOM, and I have counts tilde outcome plus treatment family equals Poisson. So this runs a Poisson regression. And if I do this, um, I get this. And I, I could do a few, few other things. Uh, I could type gom.d93, and this gives a very brief summary of the Poisson regression. And if you want a, more of a summary, you could do summary of gom.d93. And this actually, this actually gives more detail in terms of the output. And so there are other generic functions that I could apply. Summary is a generic function that I apply to this. Now the point is, is GOM is a GOM is a um, um, GOM is a generic function, and it actually is based upon the S3 class system. So if I ask, what is the class of GOM of this object? Notice that it uses inheritance. It's its class of GOM, which inherits from LM. See, it turns out that in order to compute GOMs, it does an iterative process depending upon linearization. So from a calculus point of view, I linearize. And so I iterate this nonlinear link function, but I iterate it based upon linear approximations until I get convergence. So it can actually use the algorithms from LM to compute the GOM iteratively called until I get convergence. And so I can use a lot of the code in LM in GOM. That's the point. So I don't have to rewrite it from scratch. I just use I, I wrote all this code in 
LM, why not reuse it in GOM? You, if you've had calculus, you know, you understand that there are things like Taylor series expansion, which can approximate a function by, depending on the extent of the uh, linearization, it can be, be approximated on, say, the first term, which is linear, and so forth. And so uh, it's that type of idea that we can use here. Now, if I say is list, it is a list, because when you're doing, when you're doing these S3, they're often list. And then finally, let's look at the, cl the class attribute again. I created them. It's not implicit, so I get the class attribute does exist. I'll leave you there. Almost stopped on time today. Any questions? That's a nice example. It's a statistical example um, that goes beyond the analysis of variance. Um, to Poisson regressions. You can see how easy it is to do this in R. Um, 